Number 5. Gunther Stahl In 1984, Gunther Stahl was 34 years old and he was living in Anhausen, Germany. He had worked as a food engineer, but in the fall of that year, he was unemployed. He was also suffering from paranoia. He was convinced that he was being followed by people who wanted to hurt him. When his wife asked him who was following him, he only described his stalkers in vague generalities like them and they. On the night of October 25th, 1984, Stahl was at home with his wife. At dinner, he talked about his mysterious stalkers and then he sat down to watch some television. While he watched TV, he appeared to be deep in thought. Suddenly, he said something to the effect of, now I've got it. He grabbed a pen and a piece of paper and either wrote down Y-O-G-T-Z-E or Y-O-6-T-Z-E. After writing it down, he crossed it out and then he went and put his jacket on. He told his wife that he is going out for a drink. He got into his Volkswagen Golf and drove to a bar in the nearby town of Wilsendorf. When he got to the bar, it was about 11 p.m. and he ordered a beer. Before Stahl could take a sip of his drink, he collapsed on the floor and injured his face. The other patrons of the bar got him to his feet and asked him if he was too drunk. He said that he was sober and he decided to leave the bar. He drove off in his car and no one is sure what he did over the next two hours. Around 1 a.m., Stahl was in his hometown of Seelbach, which is about six miles away from the bar. He knocked on the door of one of his parents' neighbors. The woman who lived there was in her 70s. She lived alone, and she was very religious. Since it was late, she wasn't exactly happy to see him, and she didn't let him into her house. Out on the street, Stahl started ranting, and he warned the woman that a horrible incident was going to happen that night. The elderly woman told him to go home, and she went back to bed. Stahl didn't go home, and what he did over the next two hours is a mystery. At 3 a.m., two truck drivers saw Stahl's VW1 Golf in a trench beside the Autobahn A45, about 60 miles away from his home. When they pulled up, an injured man in a white jacket ran away from the car. Inside the car, they found Stahl. He was sitting in the passenger seat, naked, and covered in blood and leaves. He was severely injured. His left arm was nearly torn off. One driver went to call for help and the other one stayed with Stahl and asked him what happened. Stahl said that there were four of them and he didn't know who they were. He survived the trip to the hospital, but he died a short time later. The autopsy showed that Stahl wasn't drunk or on drugs when he died. He also didn't die from the injuries he sustained during the car accident. Instead, he was run down by another car in a completely different location from where his car was found crashed in the trench. That means that someone hit Stahl with their car, and then they loaded him into his own car and drove his car until they crashed into the trench. When Stahl was hit by the car, he wasn't wearing any of his clothes. His shoes were in his car, but the rest of his clothes have never been found. The police interviewed Stahl's wife, and she told them about the note but she said that she threw it away that night and it has never been found. There are plenty of theories about what Y-O-G-T-Z-E means. One theory is that if the G was actually a 6, then Stahl wrote down the call sign of a radio station in Romania. But how this would relate to the case is unknown. There is even the very far out theory that Stahl somehow foresaw his own death and what he wrote down was the license plate of the car that hit him. Unfortunately, the true meaning of the note and whether it's related to Stahl's death is still a mystery. The police and Stahl's family are hoping that one day, the person or people who are responsible for his death will come forward. Number 4. Randy Parscale April 7, 1979 was a Saturday, and 10-year-old Randy Parscale was hiking with his grandfather, his uncle, and his stepbrother in Pepper Sauce Canyon near Oracle, Arizona. At one point, Randy ran ahead of everyone else, and he was far enough away that he was out of their sights. His relatives followed behind, but when they didn't catch up to him, they realized that he was missing. The canyon was searched, but it didn't turn up any traces of Randy. 
The most probable answer as to what happened to him was that he fell into one of the old mine shafts that are in the canyon. The family, on the other hand, doesn't think that Randy died in the canyon. Instead, they think that several clues indicate that he was kidnapped and he lived to be at least 20 years old. First, a tracker followed Randy's footprints in the canyon and he said that they came to an end when Randy got into a vehicle. Then, six years after he went missing, a woman living in West Virginia called the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. She said on July 4th, 1985, she was given a dollar bill as part of her change, and on the bill it said, I'm alive in Phoenix, Arizona. Help me. Randy Parscale. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children contacted the police, and they looked into it, but it didn't lead anywhere. Then in 1989, the family learned that someone had used Randy's social security number while working at a construction site in Phoenix. His father went to the construction site, but the man who used the social security number was no longer working there. The employees at the site described the man, and his father thought that their description sounded like Randy, who would have been 20 at the time. That was the last time the social security number was used, and it was the last possible trace of Randy. On the screen now is a picture of what Randy might have looked like at the age of 43. If he is still alive today, Randy Parscale would be 48 years old. Number 3. Rachel Runyon On August 26, 1982, Elaine Runyon Simmons was making Sloppy Joes for lunch for her children. Five-year-old Justin and three-year-old Rachel were outside playing with a ten-year-old boy at a park that was 15 feet from the family's backyard fence. The park can be seen in the background of their family photos, which were taken in the backyard. As they were playing, a man approached them. He was described as an African-American man between the ages of 25 and 30. He was six feet tall with a medium build and he had a mustache. He talked to the children for about 15 minutes and then he asked them if they would like to go for some bubble gum and ice cream. Rachel agreed and she started to walk away with the man. When her brother realized that a stranger was leading her away, he yelled for her to come back. She turned to walk back and that's when the man grabbed her and ran to a blue car with wood paneling. The two boys ran to the Runyon's house screaming that someone had grabbed Rachel. The police responded as quickly as they could for 1982, but by the time they got to the park, Rachel and her kidnapper were gone. Sadly, her naked body, with her hands tied behind her back, was found 24 days later, less than 20 miles away from where she was kidnapped. The murder shocked the small city of Sunset, but no one was arrested in the aftermath of the brutal crime. And then strange things started to happen. First, on two separate occasions, Rachel's father found a black rose at her gravesite. Next, about two and a half years after Rachel was kidnapped, the police were called to a 24-hour laundromat. On a stall door in the washroom, in marker, someone wrote, Beware. I'm still at large. I killed the little Runyon girl. Remember. Beware. Then below the message, there was an inverted cross, and then there was three sixes, one at the head of the cross and the other two at the arms of the cross. The police are unsure if the killer left the roses or wrote the message, but a psychologist who worked on the case said it was possible. Some people believe that the black roses and the inverted cross surrounded by 666 indicate that the murder was occult in nature. The police have had about 100 suspects in the murder, but they have yet to charge anyone. In the years since her daughter's death, Rachel's mother has been an advocate for kidnapped and missing children. In August 2016, the park where Rachel was kidnapped was renamed the Rachel Runyon Memorial Park. Number 2. Beth Doe On December 20, 1976, a 14-year-old boy made a horrifying discovery while playing under the bridge that crosses over the Lehigh River near Whitehaven, Pennsylvania. It was a severed head that belonged to a woman. Her nose and her ears were missing. The police came to the scene a short time later and they found the rest of the body. Someone had dismembered the woman and put her body into three different suitcases. Tragically, the young woman was full term pregnant with a girl. The suitcases were thrown from the bridge 300 feet above, which is part of Interstate 80, and the killer was probably hoping that the suitcases would land in the water. 
Instead, they landed beside the water, which caused two of the suitcases to break open. Unfortunately, the police haven't been able to identify her. A medical examiner determined that the woman was probably in her late teens or her early 20s. He also concluded that she died a horrible death. She had been strangled and shot in the throat. The killer then used a fine serrated knife to cut off her nose, her ears, and her breasts, and they have never been found. He used the same knife to dismember the body. The medical examiner said that she was killed 7 to 24 hours before her body was found. Two of the suitcases that held the body parts were blue, with single red, white, and blue stripes, and the third one was green plaid trim with brown. After they were zipped up, the killer spray painted the suitcases with black paint. Also in the suitcase was a pink chenille bedspread with an embroidered yellow and green flower pattern. One final clue was something that was written on the palm of her left hand. It was probably written on her hand 8 to 12 hours before she was found. It was written in ink and it said WSR and then below that it was either the number 4 or 5 and then below that and to the right it was either a 4 or a 7. The police thought that it might be a license plate or a CB call sign but when they looked into it, it didn't lead anywhere and the police do not know the significance of the writing. Since the woman couldn't be identified, she and her unborn child were buried under the name Beth Doe. In October 2007, her body was exhumed and bone and tissue samples were taken for further testing. The test indicated that she was probably born in Central or Western Europe, but she came to the United States five to ten years before she was killed. They also determined that she probably didn't live in eastern Pennsylvania, which is where her body was found. Instead, she probably lived in the southeast, quite possibly Tennessee. So while the police have a lot of information regarding the woman, what they don't know is her identity. They also have no clue who killed her. After four decades of so many unanswered questions, the case has become hopelessly cold. Number 1. John Zara The Zara family moved from Milwaukee to Franklin, Wisconsin in March 1975. Nine months later, 14-year-old John Zara was still having problems fitting in at school and he was missing his old friends. Then, on February 20th, 1976, John didn't come home from school. Fearing that he had been hit by a car or had some other accident on his way home, his father and brother drove to the school where they met the principal. The principal led them to John's locker, and inside was his school books and his winter coat. The police were called and they, along with the fire department, searched the area around the school, but they couldn't find John. They traced John's last steps, and they knew that he was in the cafeteria at lunch. After lunch, he went to study hall. He got a hall pass and left study hall, but after that, no one is sure what happened to him. One witness said that John was wandering around the school lobby and near the drafting room. Another witness said that they saw him walking towards a green Ford Torino in the parking lot. This may explain how John left the school, because he wasn't anywhere near the school grounds. John was found eight days later in a thicket in Whitnell Park, which is about six miles away from the high school. He was naked, laying face down, and his head was on a log. The medical examiner said that the cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head. She said that John had been hit three times in the head with a rock that was found at the scene. The medical examiner also found semen inside John's body. And then there was one last possible clue. On John's right wrist, written in ballpoint ink, was the word hell. The murder shocked the small community of Franklin and the citizens were hoping for a quick arrest. Unfortunately, the investigation quickly ran into trouble. First, the lead detective developed tunnel vision for a suspect, who was a contractor that was working on in addition to the school. When he was interviewed, he swore that he didn't kill John, and he said that he didn't even know him. When they asked him where he was on the day of the murder, he was confused and couldn't remember. He had a bill for a doctor's appointment for 3 o'clock that day, but he couldn't remember where he was earlier in the day. He volunteered to take a polygraph test, and it showed that he was being truthful. He remained a suspect for two years, and the case didn't make any progress. This frustrated the Zara family, so they hired a lawyer to look into the case. 
The lawyer found out that the detective had been carrying on an affair with a woman who was friends with the contractor. He used the investigation as a pretense to see the woman. The detective was eventually suspended for two months without pay, and the case went cold. The case found new life 33 years later, when someone called the West Dallas West Milwaukee Recreation Department and told them that one of their swimming coaches, Daniel Acker, was a pedophile who abused him in the 1970s. This call came just two weeks after a parent complained that Acker had showered with the children after a swimming lesson. Acker was reported to the police and he agreed to talk with them. Acker had been interviewed about John's murder back in 1976 because someone had reported his attraction to teenage boys. He said that he didn't kill John, so he was given a polygraph test. The results indicated that he was being truthful, so he was dropped as a suspect. When the police interviewed him in 2009, he agreed to let them look around his home. Everything seemed normal until they went into the basement. That's where they found a collection of toy cars and miniature models of a fire station and a police station. They lifted off the roof of the police station and on the walls of the model were pictures of missing and murdered children. Over each picture was a small LED light. Next, one of the officers picked up a matchbox car and found some names and numbers written on the bottom of it. First was the number 13 and the name Carl Galbraith. Carl Galbraith was a 13-year-old boy who was found murdered in a ditch on December 17, 1977 in New Munster, Wisconsin, which is about 30 miles away from where John went missing. Carl had been stabbed multiple times and his throat was slit. His killer has never been caught. The second number in name was 14 and John C. Zara. The detectives continued to look around the basement and they made some more disturbing discoveries. There was a photo album full of pictures of John and his brothers. They also found maps of John's school in Whitnell Park, which is where he was killed. What was most damning though was several handwritten notebooks written entirely about John. The entry dated February 20th, 1976, which was the date of John's murder, reads as follows. John C. Zero was caught, knocked down on the ground, possibly unconscious, and then struck on the right forehead with a round rock, which sadly caused the boy's death. The diary entries continued on for three decades. Acker explained that he wasn't the killer. Instead, he was an amateur detective racked by guilt. On the day that John was killed, Acker said that he planned to ride his bike in Whitnell Park, but he didn't because it was raining. When he heard that John was missing, he led a search team in Whitnell Park, but they didn't find the body. He also explained why he wrote the names of murdered children on the bottom of his toy cars and put up pictures of them in his models. He said it was a way to dedicate his hobbies to children who could no longer have hobbies. Besides being a swim coach, Acker also worked at the Milwaukee County Mental Health Complex. In April 1976, a female patient at the complex took a walk with another patient named Joe, but she didn't return. She was found a short time later. Joe had attacked her, and she was barely alive. Luckily, the woman ultimately survived the attack. When they found the woman, there was a stick in her mouth, and her head was resting on a rock. Acker asked Joe why he did that, and he said, because that's what I saw them do to the boy in the park. Acker then became convinced that Joe witnessed John's murder. Acker tried to convince the police that Joe saw the murder, but they didn't believe him, so he started his own crusade. He wrote a letter to the Zara family and told them about Joe. He even volunteered to investigate further. John's mother wrote back to him, and their correspondence led to a friendship. Acker investigated John's murder for three years, and then he went to the local television news station with his findings. He said that Joe told him that three men in a dark car kidnapped John and one of them had a gun. At the park, they took turns assaulting him and then he was pistol whipped twice before he was hit with a rock. After the news report, Joe's doctor contacted the media and told them that Joe had the intelligence of an eight-year-old. He constantly lied and he was very impressionable, so he was easy to manipulate. The police showed Joe a photo lineup and he couldn't pick out John. When he was shown a picture of John, he said that he never saw him before. Something else to point out is that the medical examiner said that John was killed by a rock. 
She came to that conclusion because of a police report that said that there was a rock with blood and hair on it found near the body. When a cold case investigator got the rock out of evidence, there was no blood or hair on it. This means that someone grabbed the wrong rock, or washed the blood and hair off the rock, or the rock wasn't the murder weapon at all. The medical examiner, Elaine Samuels, was also well known for her carelessness and her recklessness. Around the time of John's murder, she botched two sexual assault cases and one murder case because she destroyed evidence. She also left dozens of reports uncompleted. Samuels also collected dozens of human testicles without the permission of the deceased, the families, or the county. She kept them in jars in her condo and said that they were part of some research she was doing. John's autopsy was a prime example of her carelessness. For example, she didn't take samples from under John's fingernails and she didn't know what she did with the contents of his stomach. Not long after John's murder, Samuels failed the certification test to be a medical examiner. Even though she failed her certification, she didn't end up losing her job. In the crime scene photos, near the body, there was also a large, newly broken branch and it was not taken into evidence. This only added doubt to the minds of the cold case investigators as to what the actual murder weapon was. In turn, this adds doubt to Acker's guilt because in all of Acker's journals, which could have been written at any time, he only talks about John being killed with the rock. Also, the information in the journals could have come from Acker reading and watching the news. Acker was ultimately convicted on child molestation charges in 2009, and he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Another suspect was a teacher and hall monitor named Michael Yuporsky. Yuporsky had a long criminal history, dating back to when he was just 12 years old. He attacked several boys and young men, held them down, and tickled their feet. Since John's socks were tucked into his shoes, the police thought it was possible that someone with a foot fetish killed him. By the time the police considered Yuporsky a suspect, it was 1979 and he was working as a scout for the NBA team, the Seattle Supersonics. He flew to Wisconsin and he took two polygraph tests. On the first one, the tester thought that he was being purposely deceptive by gulping breaths to disrupt the machine. On the second test, the tester thought that he was being dishonest. They wanted him to take a third test, but Yuporsky refused and flew back to Seattle. Yuporsky was never charged because the police didn't have any evidence tying him to John's murder. In 1979, after they won the NBA championship, the Supersonics fired Yuporsky because of his connection to the case. Any time that he got a new job, the police would call his new employer and tell them that he was a suspect in the murder of a 14-year-old boy. Obviously, he ended up losing a lot of jobs because of the calls. In 2012, the investigator that was working on the case retired, and in 2015, a new detective was put on the case. He started from the beginning, and he looked through 6,000 pages of reports. He didn't think that the contractor or Yuporsky were viable suspects, and other detectives wasted too much time investigating them. The suspect that he couldn't eliminate was Acker, but he thought that Acker's obsession with the case could be explained because he grew close to the Zara family after the murder. He also discovered a new suspect. His discovery stemmed from a crime that happened in August 1967, which was nine years before John was killed. A 14-year-old boy was walking home from football practice in Macquin, Wisconsin, which is about 25 miles away from Franklin, when a man driving a laundry truck offered him a ride. The boy agreed and the man drove him to a wooded area and then he had him get out of the truck. He then asked the boy if he wanted to see a rope trick and he said yes. The man tied up his hands and told him to try to escape. The boy tried, but he couldn't free himself. The driver then forced him to lie down, and then he raped him. After he was done, he led the boy back to the truck with his hands still bound and drove him to another wooded area. Again, he raped the boy. He grabbed a large stick, hit the boy several times in the head, and then threw his body in a ravine. Amazingly, the boy survived and he identified his attacker as James Lee Crummel. Crummel was convicted for the assault, and he was given an open-end sentence. He ended up serving only five years. The cold case investigator thought that there were a lot of similarities between that case and John's murder. Both of them were 14-year-old boys, 
Both of them were sexually assaulted in wooded areas, and both of them were struck in the head. What really stood out to the cold case investigator was that Crummel had a tattoo on his right wrist. It was a drawing of a devil, and below it it said, Born to raise hell. The detective thought it was too much of a coincidence that John would also have the word hell written on his right wrist on the day that he died. Crummel was interviewed about John's murder in the 1970s, and he said he didn't do it. He pointed out that he was living in California at the time of the murder. He lived with a housemate, but the housemate was out of town the week of the murder, so no one could confirm his alibi. Besides attacking the 14-year-old boy in 1967, Cromwell was charged with two other murders and questioned in two others. In February 1967, he killed a 9-year-old boy in Arizona, but he wasn't charged until 1982. He was found guilty, but he only served four years in prison because a judge ruled that his defense lawyer was ineffective. Then, in 1990, Crummel led the police to the body of 13-year-old James Trotter, who went missing in 1979 from a bus stop in California. Crummel was charged with that murder in 1997, and he was convicted in 2004. He was sentenced to death. Unfortunately, the cold case investigator wasn't able to interview Crummel because he hung himself in 2012 while sitting on death row. Throughout the years, investigators have tried to test the DNA that was left at the scene, but due to the way it was stored, they have not been able to develop a profile. The police are hoping that one day, they will be able to conclusively say who killed John Zara. Thanks for watching this week's video. If you found it interesting, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe. We post a new video every Sunday. Of course, thanks to everyone who already does subscribe. Please also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter, we may even follow you back. But that's all for this week, thanks again for watching.